I have a question for you to ponder today, and it's this. If, what do you do and how do you respond when life throws your way difficulties and challenges again and again? It is a big question. I'm Veronica Tabone, sitting with Mel and Beverly King this morning, and they're going to share some of their life experiences that I know will encourage us along the lines of Psalm 46.1, which says, God is an ever-present help for us in times of trouble. Yes. So I've known Mel for many, many years, and I've also known Mel has experienced a few accidents. And it's been significant, which you will soon hear. Um, I know what he's got to share is really going to encourage you. I think of Mel as a man with nine lives, actually. When his name is mentioned, that's what comes to mind. So, Mel, tell us some of your story. Yeah, well, uh, a couple of weeks ago when Lex asked me... To, is it on? Is it on? No. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago when asked, uh, Lex asked me to give a bit of a testimony of what uh, what I went through because I had a what you call a near-death experience and I thought about it for a while and I thought well I'll I'll start from when I was fairly young and I'd say at around about the age of nine I uh, I was on a beach holiday and I I almost drowned now as fortunately I pulled out of the water by a friend who uh, see me saw me struggling in this uh, water hole and uh, so then I uh, I thought, well, you know, that's amazing. At eight years or nine years of age, you don't think much about it. You know, a few, few people sort of uh, were glad to see I was still alive. Anyway, <laughs> um, following that at about 11, I don't know if anybody's heard of Puffing Billy, but I was up there at a railway station called Menzies Creek. The, the train was coming in, and that's, that's where it used to uh, first finish at after you've been for your walk and all the day. Anyway, I'm running along the side of Puffing Billy, and like a whole lot of other little kids, but uh, you know, I fell down between the platform and the train and got dragged along uh, for a few metres. And somehow or other, I got, got myself back up again. I was pretty battered and bruised, and you know, people were sort of shocked, and I think people were screaming and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, <coughs> but not long after that, I, other things sort of happened to me, and uh, one thing that uh, Sticks in my mind was a car accident. I was 18. I just started my new job. Really, I'd been probably working for 12 months, but I <coughs> had a, what I thought was my dream car and everything else. Crossing the Maroondah Highway, which is a place uh, down in Yarra Valley near near Croydon, and uh, got slammed into by a side of, in the side of the driver's side of it on a tr by a truck. And uh, hey, what was the dream car? Holden H R Holden. <laughs> ah, no, it was good. Anyway, um, and I got towed by the tow truck driver with the the back of it. The car was on the back, and I and he tows me past my place. And my mum comes running out the door, and she saw me pulled up, or well, saw the truck pull up with my car all bashed up. And she comes running out. Now you know she didn't say, "Oh, Mel, what's happened?" She said, "You know what, Mel." I prayed you'd come home safely tonight. And like I was 18 years of age, I'm thinking, what about my car and everything else? But then I realised, it dawned on me, oh, she really had a, a heart for, uh, for me and she asked God to look after me. And it was probably the most impacting thing for a long time in my life, for a long time anyway. At the age of 20, I'm working on a building site and had this massive uh, accident where a power saw went through the top of my leg about you know, 13 inch scar in my leg, probably a couple, a couple of inches deep into my uh, thigh, and I, I, I was, my whole thinking was, boy, this is going to ruin my apprenticeship, you know, carpentry apprenticeship, my favourite thing, and I, and I'm thinking this is going to ruin me. But anyway, things could could only get worse, couldn't they? When I, at 22, I started working myself, and somewhere or other, I uh, tried to pick up too much at one stage and uh, gave myself a double hernia. Ended up in hospital with obviously the the bowel hanging out the hernia. It was probably a little bit, you know, took longer than that, but it felt like that. But now, so I had to have that operation, and I'm again 
I'm being watched over, but I don't think about it at the time much. I'm thinking, oh, you know, I've worked too hard, pushed myself. Anyway, then about a couple of years later, I have this uh, massive head-on accident with a semi-trailer. And I tell you, my life, I was 33 and my life kind of like passed in front of my eyes. I had uh, whiplash and I had a few bruises, but I, I came out of that pretty good. And, you know, it was a, a life-changing moment a bit for me, you know. Uh, at, at, um, at 35, I had, a, uh, an append had appendicitis. Well, it was that bad that I was in hospital for 10 days following on a drip because I was so um, depleted of energy. I didn't, know, even the doctor hadn't picked that I had appendicitis while I was crook. And uh, yeah, so that shock shook me about a bit. You know, and again, I knew the Lord was with me. I didn't feel as if I was on my own, but uh, at the same time, you, you think, you know, you don't need to have these things happen, do you? Anyway, uh, coming to the 13th of... Um, February 2013, I'm, by this time I'm in my 60s, or about 60-ish, and I'm thinking, I probably should be retiring soon, and these people asked me to do a alfresco veranda, and I was up there putting the final touches to the capping, and uh, I fell through the roof, two and a half metres down, and uh, I was sort of like shocked, but you know, I'll leave Bev to tell, get Bev to tell this story, you can... Say something if you so want. So I just want to just clarify here for a minute. So, building was your trade, Mel. Yeah. So you were a builder. You yeah. were doing an extension for a friend. Yeah. Which involved doing something on the roof. He was finishing off the job, putting yeah. on the end touches with the roof capping. Yeah. You fell two and a half meters, and you were you were flat out. You were out. Yeah. yeah. Right, and you were not in a good way. Now, um. It might be good just to fill in a little bit of a gap here. You didn't know at the time because you were pretty out of it, but what actually happened from the fall to the ambulance? Well, yeah, I, I, I looked up and saw the hole in the roof and I could see where I broke the polycarb and went through. And I, I could I just lay there and, and thought about it for a while and I thought, Hmm, maybe I better make sure I can uh, wriggle my toes, and I could feel them in my boots. So I thought, oh, that's good. And I thought, mm, I could see my hands moving, and oh, that's good. And then I realised I better ring somebody for help. And then I uh -oh, left my phone at home. Oh, oh that's no good. Fortunately, I had uh, had asked the owner of the home if I could use their phone, and I had to get from like say eight or nine metres. I had to get to their phone from where I was lying, and I couldn't get up. Anyway, so I'm lying there and I slid along the ground somehow or other. I got to the phone and I, I, I rang triple zero and I just said, I need an ambulance. And uh, somehow I just got myself back outside and I just lay there and I heard the ambulance come and I heard the ambos calling out and I yelled out where I was and then they trolleyed me to the ambulance and I just said I was in home, so much pain and they said, oh, we'll fix that, no worries. And then I don't remember anything after that. Mm. That's fantastic. Now, February oh, the 13th... Actually, one thing I did say... Yep. One thing I did say when I was lying on my back, I said, well, Lord, now I'm really in your hands. I've got no other, nothing I can do. I'm really in your hands. That was something that sticks out of my mind. Now, that was something... That I, all this I recall all this some weeks after I came home after hospital, anyway. Fantastic. February the 13th, I'm not sure if you really mentioned it, but that's their wedding anniversary. Now, these guys had other plans for their <laughs> wedding anniversary that evening, an outing. It didn't quite happen that way, though, did it, Bev? So tell no. us a bit about what happened. Well, I was at home and um, doing all the housework and the cleaning, <laughs> and um, I got a phone call from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and uh, they said to me that Mel had had a fall, and um, to come down, and he was in casualty. So I rang up a friend, because I wasn't really confident in driving that far. It was an hour and a half away from where we lived. So I rang up a friend, and she picked me up, and we went down there. And um, we went in there, and they, they said that um, they're going to keep him overnight and observe him and that. But he was really doped up. So I thought, well, there's no point really hanging around here. He doesn't know, really know I'm here. <laughs> So I went home and, um, and I thought I'll go and visit him the next day and pick him up. Um, so 
I was at home again and I received a call from the Royal Melbourne Hospital and they said, you have to come now, Mel's in ICU. And I went, oh, and, and he's had a turn. So um, I rang up the friend again, we went down and um, in a panic and uh, I walked in and I, I kind of thought in my head, um, I'm going to walk into Melanie's um, having a cup of tea with the nurses in bed, you know, or, you know, or something like that. And um, I walked in. I wasn't prepared. They didn't repair, prepare me properly, I don't think. And I walked in and I saw him there and I went, <laughs> this is serious. And I looked at, and all the nurses are there, you know, doing what they do. And he had um, 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 wires coming out of everywhere and... Um, the beep, beep, beeps and all that, and, uh, and and I looked at this nurse and I said, "Is he going to die?" And um, she said, "He's not. He's not good. He's not good." And I just, my heart just fell. I just thought, "Wow, I've never experienced anything like this in my life before." Mm. Then um, a few hours later, the family um, we were all. Um, Notified, and we all got together into in a visitor's lounge and the specialist came in and um, for Mel's future, because that's how serious it was, and he said a blood clot had formed in Mel's chest with, with his heart, a massive one. It wasn't little, it was massive. And um, like most people's heart and lungs, you know, but Mel's was like that and um, it didn't look good and there's nothing they could do. That was it over, you know. And uh, everyone's just looking at each other, wow, wow. <laughs> and um, so they looked at me and they said, who's the person, you know, that um, the guardian? And, and they said, oh, Bev. And um, so it was up to me to say when the life support would be turned off. And, and I just straight away in my head and my heart, I went, there's no way I'm going to do that straight away, like in the next few hours or anything. So they kind of, I kind of felt my spirit saying, you've got 24 hours. And, and straight away I looked at everyone and said, we've got to pray, we've got to pray. And um, the specialist turned around and he said, you're going to pray and you're also going to need a miracle. And that's just set me, my spirit off straight away, yeah, a miracle. And, um, yeah, so I have kind of thinking we've got 24 hours. Um that night I went home and everybody just dispersed and went home probably in shock. That night I went home, it was about 10 o'clock at night and I had to walk my dogs and I was walking down um, this street and a week beforehand I went and had prayer ministry at someone's house and um, I thought I'm going to go, I'm going to walk past this house and see if they're awake and ask them for prayer. So I went past and I could see just a little light on. I thought I'm going in no matter what, I don't care anyway, so I'm tapping on the door and um, a man named Enzo come out and he asked me what the problem was and, and he said, oh, he goes, okay. You know, he, um, he goes, have you got a hanky or anything? And I went, no. And he goes, I'll get it. I've got something. So he went and got a tissue and he prayed on that tissue with me and he said, next time you go to the hospital, put it on his chest. And so I, I, I went home and um, I got on my hands and knees and, I mean, I was begging God. God, please give me this miracle that you say, you know. And um, I, w I went to bed. I, I laid in bed for about five minutes and I thought, I've got to go down to the hospital. I've got to put this on now. <laughs> so I went down there. And um, it's funny when you're in all that fear, how you forget how scared I was driving, but I just drove anyway. And I, I went in there, probably burst into ICU, <laughs> They were pretty good in there too. And I said, you've got to put this on Mel now for me. It's got to be on there for three days. And um, they said, oh, yeah, okay. So they, they put it on. By the time I went back, they'd actually taped it on for me. So that was really cute. And I thought, that, that's so good that they'd done that. Um, the next – that day I made a list of um, people who – could pray for Mel. And you know how you can do that multi-SMSing? I, I had a heap of people in my phone, pastors, and put them all in. And every time I heard something that wasn't good, I just SMSed all these um, prayers off to people and they were all praying. Like people were praying in America, everywhere in Australia. Um, yeah, and I put a Bible under his bed. Um, 
I actually had a CD player and um, I, um, I had the, you know how you have the two microphones in each ear? I had one in my ear and Mel had one in his and I just played scripture to him all the time and music and Ken Copeland stuff and um, just all day. And, um, and, the, and I said to one of the nurses, because she's just staring at me, thinking, oh, that's pretty strange. <laughs> and I said, uh, have you ever seen this before? And she goes, I've never seen anybody do it like that. You know, and um, I thought, yeah, that's cool. I mean, yeah. I just did what I thought I could do. You know? um, as you said, I was a desperate person and nothing was going to stop me anyway. <laughs> and in the back of my mind, I was thinking 24 hours, 24 hours. Um, yeah. Even when I was in there with Mel sitting with him, there was, I could tell pastors walking in and out praying for people and, and as they walked past the bed, I go, oh, excuse me, can you pray for my husband, please? So I had that as well. That was pretty cool. Um, what else? The man who prayed on that uh, tissue, he decided to come in and actually pray with me, with Mel, and... Um, he noticed my praying technique and uh, he said, Bev, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm just praying. He goes, no. He goes, you don't need – and what I was doing was holding the Bible and, you know, like praying like that. And he said, no, you don't need to pray like that. All you have to do, it's as easy as this, is put your hand on Malcolm and let the Holy Spirit do it all. You don't even have to say anything. You just – the Holy Spirit will do it all for you. And so that was great for me because I'm not such a great prayer person. I, I feel like I don't know, never know what to say. And, um, and that helped me when other people were coming in and praying um, to say that when they said, oh, no, I can't pray because that happened. And I said, no, all you have to do is put your hand on him, you know, and, and let the Holy Spirit do it all. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins... The Holy Spirit will do it. So, you know, that was good for them. And I'm not joking. There was a line of probably sometimes 15 people ready to come in and pray for Mel. Oh, it was just wow. unbelievable. And in, look, we're talking about 10 years ago and it was actually allowed. Like they didn't – ICU didn't care, you know. They said, yeah, you can bring who you like in, you know. So that, that was pretty freeing. <laughs> um yeah, and at one stage I asked um, God for scripture and um, he led me to, I had just had the Bible, opened it up and it came to Ephesians 5 and straight away my face just went lit up, living in the light. And um, I won't read it all unless Mel wants to, but I, I, I won't. But it, it's Mel all over. When you have time, it's Mel all over that scripture. And I just knew that and I knew that God led me to that. But the end verse is, um, and where your light shines, it will expose their evil deeds. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And I, <laughs> I, if, I didn't, if it didn't happen to me, I wouldn't have believed it, but I had my hand on Mel's chest and his whole chest just rose like the breath of God was breathing in him and it went down again. And I looked around and I went, oh, I didn't want to see that. That was amazing. But no one did. So that's kind of my little thing that I think, wow. Do you and think that was a little thing? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. It was a big thing yeah. and you quoted yeah. scripture over yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I knew God's here and he's working. He's working for me. He's using me, and I just went, wow. Very powerful to me, all that. Um, so good. Um, so yeah, good. that is the um, scripture. Um, that same day, there was a lot of, well, you're in the ICU, so you're going to get a lot of people that aren't well. And there was a lady in the visitor's lounge, and uh, her husband, the night before, actually had a heart attack in, in his sleep, and he was in ICU. And a church in Essendon came and all the um, prayer people came and they were in a room and um, she said to me that they were all going to pray all night for her husband. And I said, well, why are you there? Can you pray for my, my husband as well? And she said, oh, yeah, of course we will. We'll pray for everybody in the room. 
And um, I tell you what, those people prayed like they wanted to move heaven and earth. It was so loud, they actually got in trouble from the nurses because it was too loud. But it didn't stop them, they kept doing it. So that was pretty full on as well. Um, I think that's about it. That's great, Bev. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the next morning, because I'd, I'd actually stayed a lot of the time, um, every night actually, I, I was there and I went in one morning and um, this was with, when the big breakthrough came, I went in and I, I looked and I went, he looks alive and uh, the nurses go, he's doing really well. And I, I went, wow, God is really working and I was so excited. So I went out to MM, MN's. SMS everybody and tell them, you know, like, keep praying and do what you're doing and um, something's changing. And Mel's brothers were there, two of his brothers, and they walked in, you know, like, oh, how is he? I said, no, 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 you've got to go and have a look. You've got to have a look. And they went in there and um, they came out. And we were in the visitors' lounge clapping, dancing, um, kissing each other, crying, saying... It's a miracle, it's a miracle. And it was just like in the Bible, you know, when Jesus did a miracle. And, and that's how it felt. Mm. Yeah, it was pretty powerful. And that's after that, that's when they decided that maybe they could take him off life support and see how he breathes on his own. But I can't stress enough that how he looked. He just looked marvellous. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty cool. If you were in that situation... <laughs> yeah. That would be incredibly significant, wouldn't it? So, mm. fantastic. I think, Bev, you were really bold. Mm. You were really bold. Mm. You activated your faith. You called on lots of people in our Christian community, so good, isn't it, to mm. pray. Mm. Everyone and anyone you could, by the sounds of it, which mm. is just so fantastic. You can call it desperate, but you activated your faith. And by activating your faith... God is pleased because without faith, it is impossible to please yeah. God, isn't it? Yeah. But with incredible faith, when you lean heavily on him, it yields amazing blessings. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So good. So good. Mm. Now, Mel, going back to you, when you fell, you were out of it. You actually said to yourself, oh, I'm not really in a good place here. Um, later on, I just want to emphasise, because I'm not sure if we've said this, he actually broke six ribs, two vertebrae, L1 and L4. We've heard of a big blood clot that was a serious clot. He was um, actually died and they resuscitated him, came back to life. Um, you were on fam uh, life support. Your family were called into what you called the last gasp conversation. Yeah, one of my brothers said that he called it a last gasp conversation, yeah. <laughs> you were in a coma for 10 days. Mm. And um, miracles happened through prayer. But you did have some difficulties, Mel, and... You had some difficulties with your throat. Can you tell us about that? Okay. Well, of course, then I, I came out of... The tube was taken out of my mouth. I still had a lot of other wires and tubes that, but I took the tube out of my mouth and uh, that was uh, significant because I could actually... I, I was still pretty groggy. But I do have a recollection of uh, a number of nurses and doctors standing around the bed and said, oh, I just want to shake your hand. And I go, oh, yeah, okay. They said, yeah, because we said you were going to die and you've, you've, you're alive. And, uh, you know, some of them said you're a bloody miracle and all carrying on like that. And I'm going, look, I think it was somebody up there was thinking of me and he was looking down on me and that's why I'm here. But, the, you know, it was not a lot of stuff. I just thanked them for the, their care and everything else and they all went out in the room. And then Bev came into the room and she said, uh, not long after that, she said, do you know why you're here, Mel? And I go, hmm, thinking about it for a while. I thought, might have been in a car accident. She said, nah. No, you fell through a roof. I go, oh, okay. And I, and I didn't even think twice about it. I thought, okay. And my daughters came in and they were in tears and, and they said, you know, we're just glad to see you're alive. We thought you were going to die. And, and then, you know, that day went on. There was a lot of observations and all sorts of stuff, you know. And the next day they came in, so I don't know what day it was, but I just knew the next day they came in and they said something like, right, we're going to get you up. We're going to get you walking. And they put me in a chair and I couldn't even move my legs. 
and uh, I still had catheters and uh, feeding pick up my nose. I had um, oh, stuff all, all over me, you know, and they're sitting in this chair and I felt silly. They told me just to, you know, just try and lift your legs, you know, and they set me up about three quarters of an hour and then they put me back in the bed. And that day was more observations and all sorts of stuff, you know. And anyway, on the next day, they said, we're going to put you up in a ward and then we're going to get you going the, the next day after that. So, you know, well, I found out when I put, got put in that ward, that it was a Sunday, the 24th of February. So then I cal- calculated, yeah, that was 12 days ago since I fell through the roof. I, I, th- I think it was something like that. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm lying in there and I'm thinking, I can see this calendar. It says the 24th of February. February, I'm hating hospital. I hated it when I was younger and I was in hospital. I'm thinking, I've got to get out of here. I said, how about if like, on the 28th, which is the end of February, I go home? And of course they all said, don't be, be stupid, don't be stupid. You, this is the silliest thing I've happened to you. Anyway, I said, look, that's how I feel. And they said, look, just shut up and don't say anything. And, and I just had it in my mind I was going to do that. You know, Tubes are still in my mouth and all sorts of stuff. And I hadn't even done any walking or anything. I Hadn't even, I mean, they taught me how to swallow because I couldn't swallow any water. And first swallow of water, first mouthful of water was in a teaspoon, it went straight to my lungs. Anyway, the next day they got me up. They, they, I got the swallowing thing worked out. But the next day they got me up and they said, uh, We're going to take you for a walk. And they put me in front of a walking frame which didn't have wheels, it just had slides. Because they said, If it had wheels, you'd go head over to Turkey. Anyway, I said, look, how about you take me to the toilet? That's what I want to do. <laughs> More than anything, I just want to go to the toilet. So they, they got, a nurse took me to the toilet and then uh, she run me in the shower and I, just, I felt like a million dollars. Went back to the bed and then I had other physios and nurses hanging around me. I mean, I had all sorts of blood tests and observations still going on. Anyway, I had an oxygen bottle in front of me. I had my catheter. I had uh, a peg in my nose for food. I had a, a drip coming into my arm. And all this, and they followed, and they said, look, how about we walk around the ward? Well, I slowly kind of staggered around the ward, and they got me back to bed, and I'm thinking, oh, this, is, this isn't going to be good here. I'm thinking I'm going home on the 24th, 28th of uh, December, so February, and, and it's only the 24th or 25th, maybe. I think it might have been the 25th by this day. Anyway, on the 26th, I, I talked to them to take all the tubes off me, all the all the drips and everything else. They said, all right, we'll take them all off here, you know, and I was saying, oh, I've got to get going. I can't, I can't stay in here, you know. And and, uh, and then a friend of mine came in with a Bible and, and we did a bit of reading and a bit of praying and stuff like that. And then I had pastors or clergy coming from the church and they were all wanting to shake my hand. Oh, okay, we, we thought you were going to die and we were all praying for you and everything else. And one of the clergy blokes said, how about if I use your testimony in my church sermon because you are a miracle, you've come through. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, I'm... You know, I'm starting to realise this is bigger than I thought. Yeah. Uh, also, the other thing, I, one of the things that Veronica had mentioned too was, uh, and I told her, I had this raging sore throat when I came out of ICU. And when I went into the ward, I said to them, look, there's a, there's a sucking implement here and I've got this tube. Can you, I just suck out the phlegm that I kept coughing up in my throat. I've been sucking it all night the night before and I was feeling really good and she says, hang on. No more phlegm sucking here. She said, that will give you a, a mouth infection or a throat infection. We've got to deal with not only your throat, but to get your back and your ribs and everything else. Oh, okay. So I said, I, th- I said to myself, I've got to say a prayer here. So I said, Lord, Jesus, I need healing right now. I need healing because I've got this rage and sore throat, which I realised after she told me. It. I realised I was really in pain with my back and everything else. And I just lay there and I prayed. And I, and I was on my own and all of a sudden... An hour later, she comes back into me. She said, "How are you feeling?" I said, oh, "I feel real good. I've got no more sore throat. I feel like a million dollars, you know." Now, you know, you can imagine I still wasn't a million dollars, but I felt really good. Anyway, <laughs> uh, as I say, all the tubes and everything was taken out on the Tuesday. I did have an opportunity to go for a walk around the wards. I, I ended up doing it for ten times, oh, wow. and and everybody's saying you don't have to do it that much. You only have to do it a couple of times. I said, "Hey, if I'm going to get out of here, I've got to be able to walk around, you know." Anyway, I found out there was a hairdresser in the um, foyer or down in the, uh, the ground floor. So I, I rang up the hairdresser and said, is there any chance I could get a haircut? And then Bev came in on the Wednesday morning. I said, I booked in for a haircut down there. And I said to the nurses, can I just go down there? with?" I, by this time, I'm allowed to put my pyjamas on. I was, I was out of the gowns and all the other stuff. And I had a dressing gown. And I walked, walked down with Bev to the, um, 
the hairdressers. Did you walk? No, I had a walking frame. <laughs> and a lift? And we went down the lift. It was on the, night, on the 15th floor and I had the lift, went down on the lift. And uh, we walked to the hairdresser and I sat in the chair and he trimmed my hair up and everything else. And I said, look, we better go back because we've been away for a while. And uh, Bev probably bought herself a coffee or something like that because that's what Bev likes to do. <laughs> anyway, as we're walking back to the uh, elevator, I said, look, I'm going to go up the stairs. I said, nobody knows this. You just take the walking frame up the elevator. I'll meet you at the top of the stairs the next flight. Anyway, it took me a long time to get up that flight of stairs. I was... I, I didn't. I shouldn't have even ta tackled it. I thought to myself, but no, nah, I did it. And she had the walking frame right there, and, and she walked me to the elevator. And we got to the top floor, and I lay in the bed, and I just thought, oh, this is terrible. Like, it's the 27th. I'm going home on the 28th. <laughs> anyway, the 28th turns up, and uh, well, I've got all these rehab people coming in. You've got to go to rehab, and uh, I've had blood tests, and you'd probably you know, go on warfarin and all this sort of thing, and I'd been injecting myself with some sort of blood thinners and oh, you know, I was just saying I'm hating this I'm in hospital I'm hating this every bit of it I'm hating every bit of it anyway I said how about you let me go home instead of a, to a rehab and they go oh yeah you got to you can't expect that and I said look what do I need to do to be able to go home and they said I think we need to take you down to the cardiology department and they do an ultrasound on your chest and when they've done the ultrasound we'll know how bad you are how how, how your heart's carrying on well by three o'clock that afternoon, they finally trolled me all the way down in, in a wheelchair and, and uh, I sat there and they put the uh, gel on my chest and, and the bloke going, he's got nothing wrong with his, no, his heart's as good as gold. There's nothing wrong with it. And he's ringing up everybody. See, this guy had a blood clot in his lungs and supposedly had a heart attack and nearly died and everything else. There's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a journey, hey, what a journey. So they said, we can't even find anything wrong with your heart. That's right. They were yeah, your yeah, words. Yeah, we can't yeah. even find anything wrong with your heart. So um, it must have been quite a journey for those in the hospital as well to actually watch all of that unfold. And if you just recap on a couple of those things he said, he talked, oh, Bev mentioned to me there was an ICU lady specialist that came out of ICU after life support was off and she was glowing, excited and I'm not sure if she hugged you but it sounded like she was very excited saying, he's going to make it. So that was one thing. You talked about 10 doctors and nurses all around your bed just wanting to shake your hand, saying you are a miracle. Um, I, I'm aware also that one in seven people actually come off that lung machine and live. And I was thinking about that. One in seven. A number of chaplains came to your bedside again to check in and just really see how you oh, were going yeah. and were said, impressed. yeah, they, they said, wow, this is amazing. Can I use your story? Can I use this as a testimony? Can I mention it at my church? Um, which is fantastic. But a good friend, Andrew Bennett, said something. He came in and prayed for you. He said something that I think is really worth remembering. Can you just share that? Yeah, well, uh, I remember him saying that... Uh he, uh, being a pastor and going and praying for, obviously, people with their family lost their husbands or wives or whatever, and he said, your body looked like a dead... My corpse was more... My body looked like a dead corpse, worse than what he'd ever seen before at that time when he came to pray for me. So I've he, seen better corpses, better corpses yeah. than you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's quite I impacting, isn't it? I might have been pretty it? bashed about as well. <laughs> So you've gone through some really significant things, both of you, and some significant can I, can I challenges. Just, can I just say one more thing? Sure. Here? Because I, I was a member of the Rotary Club in Lillardale and, uh, and I went along to the Rotary Club some months later and one of the Rotarians got up and said, oh, we just want to welcome Malcolm back. He's, uh, he's, he, he's, a, he's a miracle. He, he, he nearly died. And, and a few, I had them come and visit me in hospital. I can't remember when, but... All this was a bit of a blur, but they said, you know, we just want to honour him, he's back here, and, you know, it's great to see him back. It wasn't sort of super religious, but it was just, you know, we know that he's watched over. And, and one guy said, well, I remember I was in the, uh, just after I'd heard about the fall, I was in the St Vinnie's committee meeting, 
And a couple of guys came in and said, oh, you heard that Mel King's fallen th through a roof and he's about to die. And one of them says, oh, let's not have any more meetings. Let's just have pray for, prayer for Malcolm, you see. Anyway, as a guy that I knew pretty well, anyway, he prayed and he said he prayed that, or the, this chap told me, he prayed really that Mel would survive and be okay. It was good for Mel. Anyway, <laughs> after he, he said the prayer, he said, you know why I'm praying for Mel? Not just so he can live, but so he can't get to heaven before us because he's going to get and get the best seat and we're going to have the worst seat here because Mel will be taking up our seat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a funny story. But just in closing, Mel, what words would you like to leave us and the people online just so that we can, you know, think and remember what's important? Well, that psalm that you mentioned, I think when, you know, when you're in need, God is there. He's there, your ever-present help in time of need. And I think that's something that I learnt that it was one thing I've, I learnt while I was in hospital and I've learnt that all my life. Mm. I can thank the Lord because I've had parents that told me that they love the Lord and they taught me how to love the Lord. Mm. I'm not, again, I'm not super spiritual. I, I pray regularly every day and I always pray for a lot of people and I just know that God's working in my life and he works, he can work in anybody's life. Amen. It's not just me. He's there for everybody. Not everybody knows it. Not everybody wants to know about it. But I know he's there. And all he wants is the people say, yes, I need you, Lord. Mm. And, and he's there ready for you. And he loves you. And that's the whole thing. I've, I've never felt unloved. I felt loved all my life, especially by family, but also mm. just the Lord loves me every day. So good. So good, isn't that? Great message to remember. Bev, you experienced real miracle when you laid hands on Mel's chest. You saw it physically rise as you quoted scripture over him. Life actually came into him. That must have been so encouraging and also very humbling, I think. Um, I would imagine this morning that there might be people here and people online that could do with that move of God in their own desperate situation and I just think it would be great if you could lead us in a prayer and maybe Mel if you want to after that as well um, just praying for people in their situation is that okay yeah okay yep Oops, great sorry um I've written it down <laughs> um dear Jesus just as I stood next to Mel and asked you for a miracle I pray for anybody in this room and watching online um, who are desperate for you to move, like I was, please touch them and change their situation now. Amen. Yeah, and Lord, I just want to thank you that we have an opportunity to come to you. You're hearing us all the time. Our whole lives are uh, in your hands, but when we come to know you, we aren't afraid to tell you but we aren't afraid to tell others as well so i just pray that people will come to recognize that they've got a heavenly father a loving jesus and the holy spirit mm. who is with them at all times and all they have to do is to recognize it and give you the praise and glory and honor you and tell their whole family how much they love each other mm. thank you lord jesus thank you so much for sharing this morning it was um, really quite a powerful story february the 13th, 10 years ago, and I'm noticing that February is only just round the corner again, and so maybe just to end, I would like to wish you a very different happy anniversary. Woo! <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>